I realized in assembly theory that the universe is too big con to contain itself. Yeah. And, and I think this is, and now coming back, and I want to, I want to kind of change your mind about time because I'm, I'm guessing that your uh, time is just a um, coordinate. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna change I'm, your. I'm, I'm guessing you're one of those. Yeah. I'm gonna change your one of those. I'm gonna change your mind in real time, or at least attempt. To. Oh, in real time. There yeah. you go. Um, I already got the tattoo, so this is gonna be embarrassing if you change uh, my mind. Uh, but you can just add, you can just add an okay. arrow, <laughs> arrow of time onto it, yeah, right? True. Uh, just modify. Or erase it a bit. Yeah. So. Um, and the argument that I think that is really most interesting is like people say the initial conditions um, specify the future of the universe. Okay, fine. Let's say that's the case for a moment. Now let's go back to Newtonian mechanics. Mm -hmm. Now, the uncertainty in principle in, in no Newtonian mechanics is this. If I give you the coordinates of, your, of an object moving in space and the coordinates of another object and they collide mm -hmm. in space, and you know those initial conditions, you should know exactly what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. However, you cannot specify these coordinates to infinite precision. Now, everyone said, you know, oh, this is kind of like, you know, um, the chaos theory argument. No, no, it's deeper than that. Here's a problem with numbers. This is, how, this is where Hilbert and Brouwer fell out. Um, to have the coordinates of this object, a given object as they're colliding, you have to have them to infinite precision. Mm -hmm. That's what Hilbert says. This is no problem. Infinite precision is fine. Let's just take that for granted. But when the object is finite and it can't store its own coordinates, what do you do? Mm -hmm. So in principle, if a finite object cannot be specified to infinite precision, in principle, the initial conditions don't apply. Well, how do you know it can't store its... Uh... Well, how do you store an infinitely long number in a finite size? Well, uh, we're using infinity very loosely here. No, no, we're using uh, infinite precision. I mean, not loosely, but very precisely. It, so you think infinite precision is required? Well, let's let's take the object. Let's say the object is a, a golf ball. Mm -hmm. Golf ball is a few centimeters in diameter. We can work out how many atoms are on the golf ball, and let's say we can store numbers down to atomic dislocations. Mm -hmm. So we can work out how many atoms there are in the golf ball, and we can store the coordinates in that golf ball down to that number, but beyond that we can't. Mm -hmm. Let's make the golf ball smaller. And, and the th this is where I think that we think that we get randomness in quantum mechanics, and some people say you can't get randomness in quantum mechanics deterministic, but aha, this is, where, this is where we realize that classical mechanics and quantum mechanics suffer from the same uncertainty principle. And that is the inability to specify the, the initial conditions to a precise enough degree to give you determinism. The universe is intrinsically too big, and that's why time exists. It's non-deterministic. Looking back into the past, you can look at the you can use logical um, arguments because you can say, was it true or false? You already know. But this is the fact we are unable to predict the future with the precision is not evidence of lack of knowledge. It's evidence the universe is generating new things. Okay, so to you, first of all, quantum mechanics, you could just say statistically what's going to happen when two golf balls hit each other. Statistically, but that, but it, but. Sure, I can say statistic what's going to happen, but then when they do happen, yeah, and 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 you keep nesting it together, you can't. I mean, it goes almost back to look at look at look at. Um, let's think about entropy in the universe. So how do you what how do we how do we understand um, entropy change? Well, we could do the look at or process. We can look, use the ergodic hypothesis. Um, we can also have um, 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 we can also have the uh, counterfactuals where we have all the different states mm -hmm. and we could even put that in the multiverse mm -hmm. right but both those are kind of they, they, they they're they're non-physical mm -hmm. uh the, the multiverse kind of collapses back to the same problem about the precision mm -hmm. so all the, the the what you if you accept you don't have to have true and false going forward into the future um the real numbers are real. They're just they're, they're, they're just they're, they're they're observables. We're trying to see exactly where time being fundamental sneaks in. In this difference between the, the the golf ball can't contain its own position 
perfectly precisely if how that leads to time needing to be fundamental. Let me uh, I have a quick what uh, do you believe do you believe or do you accept you have free will? Yeah, I think at this moment in time I believe that I have free will. So then you are then you have to believe that time is fundamental. I understand that's a statement you've made. I'm well, no, that we can logically exactly. follow because yeah. if you don't have free will, yeah. so like if you're in a if you're in a universe that has no time, the universe is deterministic. If it's deterministic, then you have no free will. I think the space of how much we don't know is so vast that saying the universe is deterministic and from that jumping, there's no free will, is just a, too difficult of a leap. No, I logically follows. No, no, I I don't, don't disagree. It's not. I'm not saying any. I mean, it's deep, and it's important. All I'm all I'm saying, and it's the difference to it's actually different to what I've said before, mm -hmm. is that if you don't require Platonistic mathematics, and accepts that that non-determinism is how the universe looks, and that gives us our creativity in the way the universe is getting novelty. It's kind of really deeply important in assembly theory because assembly theory starts to actually give you a mechanism why you go from boring time, which is mm -hmm. basically initial conditions specify everything, to a mismatch in creative time. And I hope we'll do experiments. I think it's really important to, I would love to do an experiment that proves that time is fundamental and the universe is generating novelty. Um, I don't know all the features of that experiment yet, but by you know, having these conversations openly and getting people to think about the problems in a new way, mm -hmm. better people, more intelligent people with good mathematical backgrounds can say, oh, hey, I've got an idea. I would love to do an experiment that that, that shows that the universe, I mean, universe is too, too big for itself going forward in time. And, and I really, you know, this is why I, I really hate the idea of the Boltzmann brain. The Boltzmann brain makes me super kind of like you know everyone's having a free lunch it's like saying it's like well, let's break all the laws of physics so a boltzmann brain is this idea that in a long enough universe a brain will just emerge in the universe as conscious mm -hmm. without and that neglects the causal chain of evolution that required to produce that brain and this is where the computational argument really falls down because the computationists can say i can calculate the probability of a boltzmann brain mm -hmm. and i can and, and they'll give you a probability but i can calculate the probability of a boltzmann brain zero just because the, the the space of possibilities is so large? Yeah, it's like when we start fooling ourselves with numbers that we can't actually measure yeah. and we can't ever conceive of, I think it, it I think it, it 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 doesn't give us a good explanation. And I've become I want to explain why life is in the universe. I think life is actually novelty minor. Not I mean life basically mines novelty almost from the future and makes it actualizes it in the present. Okay, life is a novelty minor uh, from the future that is actualized in the present. Yep. I think so. Novelty minor. First of all, n novelty. What's the origin of novelty? When you go from boring time to creative time, where is that? Is it as simple as, as randomness, like you're referring to? Um, I... I'm really struggling with randomness because I had a really good argument with Yasha Bark about randomness. And he just said, randomness doesn't give you free will. That's insane because you'd just be random. Yeah. But I think, and I think he's right at that level. Yeah. But I don't think we, I don't think he is right on another level. And it's not about randomness. It's about, it's about constrained, I'm going to sound like, constrained opportunity. I'm making this up as I go along. So making this up. Constrained opportunity. So what I mean is like, so you have to have, so the, the, the novelty, what is novelty? You know, this is why I think is a funny thing. If you ever want to discuss AI, why I think everyone's kind of gone AI mad yeah. is that they're misunderstanding um, novelty. But let's think about novelty. Yes, what is novelty? So I think novelty is a genuinely new configuration that is not predicted by the past, right? And that you discover in the present, right? And um, that is truly different, right? Now, everyone says that some people say that novelty doesn't exist. It's always with precedent. I want to do experiments that show that that is not the case. And it goes back to a question you asked me a few, a few moments ago, which is, where is the factory? Yeah. 
right? Because I think the same mechanism that gives us a factory gives us novelty. And I think that that is, that is why I'm so deeply hung up on time. I mean, I, of course I'm wrong, but how wrong? And I, and I think that, that life opens up that combinatorial space in a way that, that, that our current laws of physics, or the, as contrived in a deterministic initial condition universe, even with the get out of the multiverse, David Deutsch style, which I love, by the way, mm -hmm. but I don't think is correct. Um, but it's 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 kind of, it's, it's really beautiful. Multiverse. But the that David Deutsch's conception of the multiverse is kind of like given. Um, but I think that the problem with wave particle duality and quantum mechanics is not um, about the multiverse. It's about understanding how determined the past is. Well, I don't th just think that. Actually, this is a, a discussion I was having with Sarah about mm -hmm. that, right? Where she was like, oh, I think we're, we've been debating this for a long time now mm -hmm. um, about how we how do we reconcile novelty, de determinism, indeterminism. So, so, okay, just to clarify, you both you and Sarah think the universe is not deterministic. Uh, I'm, I won't speak for Sarah, but I right. roughly, ha I, I think that the universe, ha I think the universe is deterministic. Looking back in the <laughs> back in the past, right? But undetermined going future, going forward in the future. Yeah. So I'm kind of having my cake and eat it, eating yeah. it here. This is because I fundamentally don't understand randomness, right? Yeah as Yasha told me or other people told me. Right. But if I adopt a new view now, which um, the new view is the universe is just non-deterministic, but I'd like to refine that and say, the universe appears deterministic going back in the past, mm -hmm. but, it's, it, but it's undetermined going forward in the future. So how can we have a determinist, a universe that has deterministically looking rules that's non-determined going into the future? Yep. It's this breakdown in precision in the initial conditions. And we have to just stop using initial conditions and start looking at uh, trajectories and how how um, the combinatorial space behaves in an expanding universe in time and space. And assembly theory helps us quantify the, the transition to biology. And um, biology appears to be in novelty mining because it's making crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that that we are unique to Earth, right? That the, the, there are objects on Earth that are unique to Earth. They will not be found anywhere else because you can do the combinatorial math. Uh, what was that statement you made about life is novelty mining from the future? Yeah. What's the what's the, what's the little element of time that you're introducing? So what I'm kind of meaning is because the future is bigger than the present. Yeah. In a deterministic universe, how do you go from the how do how do the how do the states go from one to another? I mean, there's a mismatch, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So that must mean that you have a little bit of indeterminism, whether that's randomness or something else. I don't understand. I want to do experiments to formulate a theory to refine that as we go forward that might help us explain that. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's why I'm so um, determined to try and crack the the non-life to life transition, looking at, at networks and molecules, and that might help us think about it, the, the mechanism. But certainly the future is bigger than the past in, in my conception of the universe and some conception of the universe and by the way that's not obvious right that's what it was just kind of the future being bigger than the past well that that's one statement and the statement that the universe is not big enough to contain the future is another statement yeah 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 I, that one is a big one i i'm I, that was a really big one i think so i think it, but i think it's entirely because look we have the second law mm -hmm. and right now i mean i'm we don't need the second law if the future's bigger than the past. It follows right. naturally. Right. So why but are we retrofitting all these these sticking plasters onto our reality to hold on to a timeless universe? Yeah, but that's because it's kind of difficult to imagine the universe that's <laughs> that can't contain the future. But isn't I mean, that really exciting? It's very exciting, but it's <laughs> it's hard. Uh, I mean, we're we're humans on Earth, and we have a very kind of four dimensional conception of the world of three mm -hmm. D plus time. It's just hard to intuit a world where what does that even mean? A universe that can't contain the future. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of crazy, weird. but obvious. It's weird. I mean, I, I suppose it sounds obvious, yeah, if it's true. But the nice <laughs> thing is, you can. 
So what I, I mean, so the reason why assembly theory turned me onto that was that you let's let's just start in the present and look at all the complex molecules and go backwards in time mm -hmm. and understand how evolutionary processes go, go gave r r rise to them. It's not in it, it's not at all obvious mm -hmm. that taxol, which is a complex one of the most complex natural products produced by biology, was going to be invented by biology. It's mm -hmm. an accident. You know, taxol is unique to Earth. There's no taxol elsewhere in the universe, mm -hmm. and taxol was not decided by the initial conditions it was decided by this kind of the this interplay between the so the past simply is embedded in the present it mm -hmm. gives some features but why the past doesn't map to the future one to one is because the universe is too big to contain itself that gives space for creativity novelty and and on some things which are unpredictable